Praise the Lord. Hey, like that. All right. I'm glad. I'm glad I'm saved. Amen. Oh, say, but I'm glad. You look at what's going on in the world, you'll sing, oh, say, but I'm sad. But then you look at what God's doing, get back in that Bible, and, and uh, you'll say, oh, say, but I'm glad. Somebody got saved somewhere today. Somebody's getting saved right now, somewhere in this world. All the missionaries, all the preachers, all the witnesses there are, somebody's getting saved every hour of every day somewhere in this old world, and we thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for that. Anybody here been saved in the last, in the last year? Anybody here tonight has been saved in the last year? Praise the Lord. See, I always ask that because people say, well, you know, I just don't think it does any good to get out there and knock on doors and give out tracts and preach and all that. And, and every, every church I go in, somebody's just been saved recently in the last few months. The Lord's still saving people. Praise God. So, all right, we started last night talking about uh, things that happened on mountains during the life of Jesus. And I want to read you two verses out of Hebrews. We'll, re- we'll read them together before we start tonight because... Uh, they're, they're, they're only controversial because people uh, often decide what they believe and then go to the Bible to, to back it up right. instead of believing what the Bible says. Right. And sometimes we run across something in the Bible and it causes people, um, it troubles them because it's not something they thought would be in the Bible or it's not something their theology allows for. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5, let's pray before we can read the Bible. Uh, Father, help us tonight. Bless these that have made the effort to come and be in a church service on a Tuesday night. And uh, we sure thank you for that. Thank you that we can meet in this liberty and freedom tonight. Pray you'd preserve it in our nation until the rapture. And Father, we ask you to bless your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the Bible says, speaking of Jesus Christ, in Hebrews chapter uh, 5 and verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, who in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications, and if we, we, we'll read uh, more of that uh, tomorrow evening, but come down to verse 8 now. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now, perfect in your Bible doesn't mean sinless. Jesus was always sinless. Perfect in your Bible means complete. It means entire. It means uh, uh, all that can possibly be. And this really troubles people when I say this, but I didn't say it. I'm just showing you the Bible says it. Jesus Christ, we believe, is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's almighty God. He was manifest in the flesh. And the Bible says that when he was manifest in the flesh, he learned some things. And having learned those things, he was, we only dare say it because the Bible says it, he was more Perfect. He was more complete than he was before he came down here. Now that sounds impossible until I introduce what we're going to talk about tonight. There's no way that God was ever hungry. But Jesus was. There's no way that God was ever thirsty, but... Jesus was. The God of the Old Testament neither slumbers nor sleeps, and yet we read in the gospel of Jesus being asleep. The Almighty God sat down on a well in John chapter number 4, wearied from his journey. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, he had... Your God, my God, the only true God, had never experienced human life. He had given commandments to men. He had never borne the yoke of those commandments. He had told men how to live. He had never lived the human life for himself. When he returned to heaven... 
Uh, we, we've always had a God who heard prayer and answered prayer and came to the assistance of those that called upon him. But now the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, we have a high priest who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Now when a hungry man prays to God, the God to whom he is praying has been hungry. When a thirsty man, a weary man, a tired man, here in, here in the passage in Hebrews 5, when a man who is facing death and is troubled by the, by the very thought, prays to God, he's praying to a God who has experienced all of those things in his own human life and in his own human body. It's, it's really an incredible thing. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Again, talking about Jesus Christ, verse 24 says, But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So, So up above the heavens tonight is a high priest, Praise the Lord. And what he's doing with his life is not creating, that's done. Not paying for sins, that's done. Not establishing and, and ruling a kingdom, that, that's future. What he's doing right now is praying for saved people. He ever liveth, if he's alive, he's making intercession For the saints. Isn't that a blessing? All right. Let's turn the Bibles to Luke chapter number 6. Luke chapter number 6. Here is the man on earth. The Bible says in Luke, this before he, obviously, before he dies on the cross, before he rises from the dead, before he ascends back to heaven. In Luke chapter 6 and verse number 12, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles, Simon, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Simon, Judas, And another Judas. Verse 17, And he came down with them and stood in the plain, and the company of disciples, and a great multitude of people, and and so forth. So here is God the Father on his throne in heaven, and God the Son in his humanity down here on earth. And there are sick people to heal. He's just healed one we have no, one notable example there in Luke. He has been through the uh, temptations in the wilderness that we read about last night in Luke chapter number 4. And here the Lord of glory sees fit to withdraw from all of the disciples and withdraw from all of the needy multitudes and withdraw from all the duties of the day and climb the steep slopes of a mountainside and sit there and pray. And from the context, it seems that he is praying and seeking his father's Direction, his father's will, with regard to choosing a small group of apostles out of a large number of disciples. Because the Bible, the wording of the Bible is pretty clear. He goes up on this mountain, he prays all night. At the end of that night of prayer, out of the disciples, he said, okay, I'll take you, and I'll take you, and I'll take you, and I'll take you. And he, he chooses the twelve, including Judas Iscariot, whom John chapter 6 says was a devil, And Jesus knew he was a devil when he picked him. Now what do we make of that tonight? That's 2,000 years ago. We're saved, born again 
Christians in the body of Christ, and this is, this is pre-Calvary. It's the Messiah walking about uh, doing good to those that, that follow him. I'll tell you what we make of it. If this sinful son of Adam, living in a body of flesh, learns anything from the verses you just read, how much more do I need? Seasons and hours and nights of prayer. If, if, if Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, saw fit to spend a night in prayer with his Father, how is it that we make these huge decisions in our life without consulting God? The choice of a, of a church home, the choice of a, an actual home, the choice of a vehicle, the choice of a spouse, the choice of a career. I, I hear people uh, all the time, they just, they just decide to do something. And if it doesn't work out, then they go to God in prayer and say, God, why don't you fix this mess that you... And God said, well, if you'd ask me... <laughs> I would have told you, if you had sought my counsel, James 1 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. I'm, I'm amazed that any of us uh, are, have reached the point in life that I have, that your pastor has, and, and we've been as, as blessed to the extent that we have been. When you're as old as I am and you look back, you realize... The biggest decisions you ever made in your life, what to do for a living and who to marry, you had to make when you were as dumb as you would ever be. I mean, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Somebody 18, 19, 20, 22 years old gets married and stays married chooses a career and actually makes a living because at that point in time in your life, we are so, and I'm not trying to be insulting, but you have no idea how arrogant you are. You have no idea how self-confident you are. You have no idea how how short-sighted you are. And I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm just telling you, this is a long road and there's some crazy stuff down that road that you don't know anything about. And if riding down that road with you is the man or the woman you started out with, that's a real gift of God. But how much more, how much more when you realize that so many people choose a spouse without consulting God? So many people pick a career without consulting God. So many people join the wrong church because they never ask God about it. Leave the right church because they never ask God about it. They just, they just do what the family wants them to do or what a friend wants them to do or what their feelings want them to do. Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory. He said, I'm about to pick 12 men They're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel for a thousand years. I better spend some time in prayer. I better talk to my father about this. Not one of those 30 second God bless it kind of things. All night. All night. Now we talked last evening, and I, I'm not one of these people who says you have to you have to pray 30 minutes a day and read your Bible 30 minutes a day. And I, I I'm not one of those one of those people, but but I do like to reason with myself and reason with you. When you met that girl and fell in love, well, you better be glad you live in the days of cell phones. It used to be expensive to talk for an hour on the phone to a girl who lived out of town, but you gladly paid it. And you, you'd ride in that car and, and you'd go, I don't know if, what kind of church you were in. Maybe you dated, maybe you courted, maybe you, you chaperoned. It's all the same stuff. We just call it different names so we can outstandard each other. But you sit there in that Dairy Queen, man, and nobody's ever made a milkshake last as long as you made that milkshake last because you just wanted to talk and 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 talk. And then you get married and you say, what are you talking so much for? I thought you liked to talk. You used to like to talk. Anyway, Here's here's what I'm saying. 
You know why, you know why it's easy to talk to that boyfriend or that girlfriend for an hour and hard to pray for an hour? It's not a real relationship. God is a fact in our brain and God is a, a, a thing or a, maybe we would even say it correctly. He's a person we believe in, but it's, it's not really a relationship. He's not really somebody you just talk to. He's not really somebody you just visit with. He's not really somebody you just just hang out with. Jesus had a real relationship with his father. And they could talk all night long. And did. And did. And I would just encourage you. I'm not saying you you have to pray from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Or you have to get up at a certain time. And you have to pray for a certain length of time. I'm just telling you. Before you switch careers or switch churches or go into debt for that car or, or bring children into the world and you can't afford the ones you got. And I'm just telling you, we make really, really big choices in life. And it's a shame people spend hours reading reviews on the Internet before they buy something on Amazon. And they won't spend hours talking to God about making huge decisions in their life. And if Jesus Christ felt the need to get up in a mountain away from everybody else and talk to God all night before he picked those 12 disciples, maybe we ought to spend a little more time consulting the Lord and asking his counsel, asking his advice. Now, I'll tell you what else to help you with. If you've really prayed about something and you've really sought God about something and God's really come through and answered your prayers, I'll tell you how it helps. There, there, to this day, there's no doubt in my mind that God directed us to start the Bible Baptist Church in Deland, Florida. And we, and we street preach in Deland, Florida, and there's, there's two little roads that intersect downtown, and the businesses are, are they're just a, a, a single little sidewalk there, and you're right in the door of the businesses. It's just, it's such a hassle to them. It's such a point of conflict. It's, it's what God wants us to do. But then we go over, go down to Orlando an hour away on Saturday night. Big nightclub district down there. We go to Daytona Beach and there's a racetrack there and the, and the boardwalk like you have here in Virginia Beach. And I, I've thought so many times, if we'd have started the church in Daytona or Orlando, it would be bigger. There'd be less conflict. Would... And then things happen. You pray, you marry the right, there's no doubt in my mind, no doubt in my mind that God gave me the wife he gave me. She is a true helpmeet. I couldn't have a, for the work God's called me to do, I couldn't have a better wife. We've had a few little issues along the way. We've only had one argument. It's lasted over 40 years, but we've only only had... uh, We've only had one argument. It's been a good one. <laughs> no, here, here's my point. Jesus sought his father all night in prayer. And when he came down, he chose 11 men and then Judas. And then Judas betrayed him. Now listen. I'm not saying it's an easy thing to deal with betrayal. But it's a lot easier when you know it wasn't your mistake. It wasn't something you walked into because you didn't consult God. When we've had, we've, we had one split, terrible split. We've had some, some rough times at that church. What a blessing to know we're not having these problems because I'm in the wrong town doing the wrong thing out of the will of God. When my wife and I have had trouble, we always, we're always able to work it out because the, we never have to deal with the thought, well, maybe we shouldn't be together. Because we, we know we sought God and this was, this was the will of God. You have, you have problems in your church. You don't say, well, maybe I'm in the wrong church. No, you know you're in the right church because you sought God about it. And I'm telling you, it's not if I pray, everything will go right. No, if I pray when things don't go right, I won't lose my assurance that I'm in the will of God because I sought God before I did it. This wasn't my will. This wasn't me acting independent of the Lord. 
This is, as we saw last night, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. In answer to prayer, Jesus chose 12 apostles and one of them was there to fulfill the scripture regarding his betrayal. So it helps to pray. And if Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? Now, three passages all together. Uh, Mark, uh, Matthew 14. Matthew 14. It's all one event, but a little different wording. Matthew 14 and Mark 6 and John 6. Matthew 14, Mark chapter 6 and John chapter 6. Okay, Matthew 14 verse number 20. Two, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, and he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea and you're probably familiar with the rest of the story, how the Lord um, got them through that storm. Now look at Mark chapter number 6 and verse 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land, and he saw them... And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. Now, in John chapter 6, let's go there. John chapter number 6, and let's start reading at verse number 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. And uh, so when they had rowed five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship. And they were afraid. Okay. So in these three passages, we have three accounts of Jesus Christ Again, going into a mountain, up into a mountain to pray. Let's take the John account as an example. That day he had taught a great multitude of people who had come from great distances to hear him teach. 5,000 men besides women and children. They had stayed so long listening to him teach that it was now past mealtime, and there's no food, and you know the story of the boy with the five barley loaves and the two small fishes, and Jesus fed the multitude. Now that evening, his disciples not only have a, a journey to make, but one that turns out to be a very dangerous and a very perilous journey as they, they row their little boat, well, they sail their boat into a storm and now you gotta take the sails down, now they're trying to row and, and it's, it's so bad they, they rowed about 25 furlongs, <laughs> no, about 20, <laughs> no, about 25, no, about 20. The reason the Holy Spirit doesn't have the exact numbers that winds just, just contrary to them and they make some progress and then they lose it, make some progress and then they lose it. And here's what I want to make of this for you, for me this evening. Jesus had a lot to do. And he put every bit of it on hold. Because what he had to do more than feed another 5,000 people. 
What he had to do more than teach another lesson. What he had to do more than get some disciples out of a terrifying jam. He had to spend time with his father in prayer. Now listen, he's not dealing with sin, he's not a sinner. He's not asking for help with his temptations and his trials and his troubles. He didn't have any of that to pray about. And I'm telling you tonight, if the sinless Son of God thought it necessary, and the Holy Spirit wrote it down so you'd know what he did, to suspend everything he had to do on one day and in the middle of the night in order to spend time in prayer with his Father, We just cannot keep making excuses and saying, I'm too busy to pray. I've got too many things to do. We've got to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and learn from his example and just say, that's going to have to wait. I've got to pray. I'm going to have to put that on hold. I've got to pray. Now, I'm looking at at mothers tonight who love their children and wives tonight who are true helpmeets to their husbands. And I'm looking at men tonight who have a great duty and responsibility of providing for their households and working for a living. And I'm looking for people who are part of a church that doesn't let you just come and sit. We got work to do for Jesus. But this night, when he went into that mountain to pray... There were a lot of people trying to get home in the dark. And he, I mean, I don't mean to add to the Bible, but he doesn't he kind of just say you're going to have to get home on your own? The ones that said, we can't travel all that way in the dark to get back home. Well, then what did they do? They camped where they heard him teach on that hillside. And guess what? <laughs> Five barley loaves and two small fishes fed them at supper time, but there's no breakfast the next morning. There's no packed lunch waiting at the checkout counter of the motel for you to take on the road and eat on the way back home. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is on a mountain praying, and there's a bunch of people down at the foot of that mountain that need a meal. But he's up there praying. And those disciples... They're out there in that ship and, and those are some pretty high waves and some pretty strong winds and they're not getting anywhere and they're in great danger. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they would have liked the Lord to drop everything and come running to help them. And I'm not adding to the text, but it's as if the Lord's saying, you just have to keep rowing a while because I need to talk to my father. You're just going to have to take some seasick pills and and ride those waves out. I'll be there directly, but right now, I just got to talk to my father. You know something, we use use terms. I'm I'm not trying to be critical, but I hear people say, I have to go to the store. I have to go to Walmart. I have to mow the yard. I have to clean that cabinet. I, I have to get this, uh, th- this done. I have to get that done. When's the last time someone in your household said, I, I have to pray? I have to talk to God. I just, I have to turn off everything. I have to unplug everything. I have to set aside everything. I have got to get in that bedroom and shut that door and just talk to God. And I know what you say and what I say because it's, it's our lives. We are so busy. We're so busy. I'm taking a, a history class right now, a professor from Emory University. I'm really enjoying him. He's bringing out some things I've never heard before. But it's really interesting. He said, in the history of the world, you, you, can, you, can, tell, you can tell the times by the literature. And he said, during the Great Depression." Men wrote books wondering, how is it that we have rich people in the world? How did they get to be so rich? How did they get to be so comfortable? And he said, by the 1960s in America, we were writing books on, how are there people living in poverty? 
How can there be poor people in our country? Now, you know what's happened? And I'm not calling for it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for it. But my grandparents, when the sun went down at night, you might have read a little Bible by candlelight. You might have read a book by candlelight for a little while, but that, that, that gets, gets old in a hurry. There is no radio. There is no TV. You're not getting in the car and going to town and then stopping at the mall and stopping at the auto parts store and then stopping by the ball game and you're... When the night falls, the night falls. When you get up in the morning, you're not turning on the TV to depress yourself with the, with the fake news of the day. You know what's happened? Our lives, we have 28 hours of stuff to do and stuff to listen to and places to go crammed into 24 hours and we just wear ourselves out. The husband's worn out, takes it out on the wife. The wife's worn out, takes it out on the husband. The parents are worn out, take it out on the kids. The kids are worn out, take it out on each other. People drag themselves into church. They're worn out, they take it out on the preacher. You know what, listen, nobody ever had more to do than Jesus had to do, and he's got to get it all done in three and a half years. And you know what he did? He said, 15,000 people here, glad you came to hear me preach. Disciples, get across the water. we got work to do over there tomorrow. Well, Lord, you're going to sail with us? No. Lord, you're going to stay here and camp with us? No. Lord, you're going to work a miracle and fix us breakfast tomorrow morning? No. What are you going to do? I'm going to go up in a mountain and talk to my father. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to say this carefully because I don't want to be a hypocrite. And I I, I don't want to cause you to be neglectful of any of your duties. But I'm telling you, he thought that was more important than everything else he had to do. Now, he still had all the other things to do. But obviously, you can do your duty and still have time to pray, or better yet, you can have you can take time to pray and still have time to do your duty. And if I if I if I don't have time to pray and do my duty, then maybe I need to look and see what else is going on in my life that's there that doesn't need to be there. But don't you find it really important, really interesting that Jesus put everything on hold? He didn't have to stop sinning. He's not sinning. He didn't have to stop doing silly things. He wouldn't do any silly things. Really vital, important things that the Messiah came to do. The Messiah said, not now, not now. Don't bother me, boys. Y'all go get in the boat. All you people need here preaching. You can hear some more preaching tomorrow. Right now, I've got to get some quiet time with my father. How about that? How about that? Your pastor's got a lot of duties, a lot of responsibilities. It'll just become a job and he'll become a machine if he doesn't stop spend some time with God. I know sometimes we just, we just feel as though I've got to be calling somebody or visiting somebody or, or knocking on door. I've got to be doing something 24 hours a day or I'm not earning my keep. Jesus said, Jesus said, I got to be doing something 24 hours a day. But part of that, what I have to be doing is talking to my father in prayer. And sir, if your, if your duties don't, don't include prayer, sister, if your duties don't include prayer, you need to make a new duty list because it's mighty important. Now, let's, let's push it forward to our day. You know what Jesus, when Jesus died upon the cross and rose from the dead and ascended up to the right hand of the Father, you know where he went? Mount Zion. Mount Zion in the sides of the north. So t- tonight, tonight, the Lord Jesus is sitting on a mountain. Praying. And you know what we're doing? We're just down here seemingly in the dark, 
<laughs> rowing and rowing and toiling and toiling and not getting anywhere. And, we, and we, we're so tempted to think as another wave crashes over the bow of our little boat, as the wind tosses us this way and that way, as the waves go up and crash us down and we're, we're just so afraid and so terrified. Uh, it's fun. Everybody's different. Everybody's different. Man, I was on an airplane coming up here yesterday. You just, there, I, could, I, I don't know how you could be any more afraid than I am flying in a plane when that thing gets bouncing and moving side to side and dropping and you think, oh, here it goes. It's, it's, it starts dropping. I think, well, we're going all the way to the bottom this time. I can get in a ship out there in the, in the, in the ocean, middle of the ocean, and that thing's going all over the place. And I, woo, it's just great. And my wife said, how come you're not afraid in the boat, but you're afraid in the airplane? I can swim. I can't fly. <laughs> it's, it's enti- to me, it's an entirely different concept. <laughs> anyway, those disciples out there on that ship, and you know what? You know what they're inclined to think? I sure wish Jesus was here. I sure wish the Lord was here. You know what you read in, in those three passages? He knew where they were. He knew about the wind. He knew about the waves. He knew about the darkness. He knew about their fear. Listen, listen. And he continued to stay on that mountain and pray instead of jumping every time they called. If you just got saved, you're going to see God do some amazing things in your life and you're going to come to church and you're going to say, you won't believe how God answered my prayer. You won't believe how God worked in my life today. You won't believe. It's just, it's just amazing. And you know what some of us will say? Yeah, I remember when you did those things for me. I don't say that begrudgingly and I don't say that in, in anger, disappointment with the Lord. Here's what I'm telling you. There came a point in time in my Christian life and in many of yours when the Lord knew it was time for me to just ride out a few storms. It was time for me to go up and down with some really scary waves and it was time for me to be tossed about by some really strong winds and it was time for me to spend some hours in the dark. You have that little baby, your first one. Your first little baby, and every time it whimpers in the night, you, I don't know if, we, if you ever sleep like the first year after you have a baby. and every, Oh, the, the baby, the baby. Did you hear the baby? I think the baby turned over. I think the baby cried. I think the baby blinked its eyes. And you run and pick up that baby. And that poor third, fourth, fifth, sixth child, they can just cry all night and mom and dad just sleep right through it. <laughs> No, but you know something, wouldn't it be a, wouldn't it be a, a, a sad thing if some, some, some guy at church, he's 15 years old, he's not paying attention to what he's doing, and he walks in, bangs the knee on the pew, and he goes, ouch, and his mom runs over, you okay, sweetie, you okay, sweetie, let me, let me kiss your little knee and make it feel better. You're like, mom, stop. We used to fall off our bikes and stuff, and our dad would say, Yeah, it's another scar. That'd be, that'd be something you can show off when you get older. Yeah. How many of you ever heard, had an adult tell you to rub some dirt on it? You just fall, fall and bust your neck. Nah, rub it. Get up, rub some dirt on it. <laughs> oh, man. You know something? You've been saved a while. Jesus isn't going to come run as fast as you want him to. He's not going to come make the wind die down every time it's blowing your hair around. He's not going to calm, every, uh, calm the waves of the sea every time they're making you a little sick. I mean, eventually he'll come. In his time, he'll, he'll come and, and help you out. But what you need to understand in every one of those storms of your life, I have a high priest who is on a mountain apart and he's interceding for me right now. He is praying for me and he never stops. I don't have to see him walking on the water. I don't have to see him stand in the boat and calm the wind. I know he's looking out for me. 
That's a real blessing. It's a real blessing. To have, have somebody that powerful watching out for you in that way. Now, come, come back to the John chapter 6 passage. The Bible says in verse number 20, or, or uh, 19, 19, I'm sorry. So when they had rode about 5 and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. They were afraid. But he saith unto them, it is I, be not afraid. Now look at Mark chapter 6. Look at that passage again. Verse number 48. And when he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them walking upon the sea. And would have passed by them, but when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And then Matthew 14, Matthew 14, verse 25, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went on them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. So here's the last thing I want to say, and then we'll take a break. (laughs) You might be better off. You might be better off with Jesus up there on that mountain praying for you than you would be if he appeared in some unusual, miraculous, supernatural way like walking on the sea in the middle of the storm. When he showed up, they were more afraid than they were before he got there. When he came, they didn't recognize him for who he was. They didn't think he was there to help. It only added to their, to their fear. Here's how I want to apply that this evening. And, and I, I hope I'm right about this. I think I'm right about this. I'll go back to that relationship thing. When you, when you meet that, that girl, you know, the one. You meet the one. You see her across the other side of the church and, and you do the whole, you know, the, your eyes bug out of your head and your heart's pounding your chest and, and you go to try to say hi to her and Rapunzel comes out. You, you, you wanted to say hi, but you said Mephibosheth and it just, it's all weird. That, that girl. And I don't know what it's like for the girl. I think it's like, you know, he's not too bad looking. How much do you make? <laughs> what, whatever, whatever the big questions are. <laughs> but you know what? You know what? You know what it takes. You, you know why you have those long phone conversations. You know why you have those those trips to you know a, a, I mean, really big time Christian date. You know, go to Chick Fil A, play, pay twice as much for the food because you think it's Christian. They give away free food all the time. No, that's not, they're not giving away free food. They're, they're able to do that because you paid eight bucks for a piece of chicken that big, you know. Yeah. Anyway, you know why you do all that stuff? Because you're not sure she really likes you. You're not sure she's really going to fall in love with you. You're not sure she's really going to marry you. You know why now you sit around the house in, in that t-shirt? Feet up on the furniture. Because you're just so comfortably confident in that relationship that you don't have to have something miraculous happen every Friday night in order to know that it's going to work. Now, it wouldn't hurt guys maybe once every so often to have a miracle like, you know, a shower and, you know, be polite and... That sort of thing. But you understand what I'm saying? The reason we, we, we pour everything we've got into trying to win someone is because we're not sure the relationship is going to last. But once we're sure the relationship's going to last, it really just kind of, you just kind of settle down to enjoying each other. 
I visited a couple last week. They've been married 66 years. They got this great big house, great big house. And they got two reclining chairs that sit right beside each other. And the man said, you know, we just spend most of the day just sitting here in these two chairs, just enjoying being next to each other. Isn't that something? You know what what I see in this passage? I don't like storms. We're going to have them as long as we're alive. I don't like high winds and high waves. We're going to have them as long as we're alive. But there comes a point in your relationship with the Lord when He doesn't have to work a miracle every time you've got a problem. He doesn't have to show up and do something supernatural right this minute or we're going to die. You've been through enough of these storms to know we're not going to die. If he told us we're going to the other side, we're going to the other side. Amen. I get on that plane. I said, Lord, please, please. Uh, You don't owe me a thing. But if this could be a smooth and easy flight, I'd sure appreciate it. I get up in the morning. Lord, you don't owe me a thing. But this could be a smooth and easy day. I'd appreciate it. You know, maybe I'm just getting old. But there's going to come a point in your Christian life when smooth and easy is better than a miracle. Because if you need a miracle, it means you're crippled or you're lame or you're blind or you're at Lazarus' tomb or something like that. I mean, you don't, you don't need a miracle in the ordinary. You need a miracle in the extraordinary. And I'm telling you tonight, Jesus Christ ever, ever lives to pray for you. And if you're in a mess and you're in a storm and the Lord hasn't come and stopped that storm, he's doing something just as good. He's praying to get you through it. Isn't that a blessing? So there's Jesus uh, four, four times in the Gospels going into a mountain to pray. And if the Son of God needed to spend time in prayer... I'm certain every one of us could spend some more time in prayer. No doubt about that. All right, Father, thank you for the Bible, for the example of our Savior, and pray, Lord, that it would, uh, would be profitable to have considered these things in our lives. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen.